I wasn't exactly a fan of Gungrave VR. In fact, I specifically mentioned in my review a few years back that it made me extremely sceptical of Gungrave Gore, a proper Gungrave sequel being made by the same team, South Korean developer Studio Igimob. Well, it took long enough, but Gore did eventually release two abysmal reviews. Critics didn't like it. Not a lot of regular people liked it either, going by the Steam reviews. And I was definitely interested in playing it. Gungrave is my favourite game series for drunk salarymen, after all. And I consider Grave himself to be one of the more underrated video game icons. Aesthetically, he resembles a 90s western comic book anti-hero, but with a story that largely pays tribute to the heroic bloodshed subgenre of Hong Kong action cinema. You have infinite bullets and the durability of a tank. Go nuts. It's a style of game that simply doesn't get made anymore. It has no pretensions about it. None of the overwrought baggage of modern gaming. It knows exactly what you're here for. A cool, straightforward action game focused entirely around shooting relentless onslaughts of enemies. It's a game with exactly one mission objective. Kick their ass. But I think it's for this reason that Gungrave Gore got savaged by reviewers. Very few were willing to accept what it was trying to be. It's the first real Gungrave game since Overdose in 2004, and it doesn't do much to modernise its gameplay and mechanics. In fact, in some ways, it takes a step back from Overdose, in a good way. Grave's slower, lumbering movement is definitely a lot closer to the first game. It's what you'd expect from a sequel, but not necessarily a sequel made almost 20 years after the fact. It was originally conceived to be a Souls-like, or some kind of open-world take on the series. But eventually, they decided to go with a true, uncompromising PS2 throwback. I see this as one of the game's strong points, but where I saw a PS2 Kino, others just saw bad and dated mechanics. Its beautiful simplicity was mistook for a lack of depth. A lot of the reviews complain about difficult sections that wouldn't be too out of place in a PS2 game. Like this train, for example. Which kind of reminded me of a similar part from that Cowboy Bebop PS2 game I reviewed years ago. This train was the game's filter for a lot of people. But when you get right down to it, it was just a difficult section in a video game. Those are very rarely allowed to exist anymore without being unfairly labelled as bad game design. Unless it's a From Software game, then it gets a pass. Simply put, the world was not ready for Gungrave Gore. In fact, I don't think a lot of Gungrave fans were ready for it either. Which is a shame, because I think it's a damn good sequel. Maybe even the best in the series. And it more than redeems Studio Igimob for their lackluster VR titles. At least in my eyes. It's not a perfect game by any means, and it has its fair share of flaws, as every game in this series does. Visually, it has that ugly, Unreal Engine sheen that's a far cry from the moody, cel-shaded look of the first game. It did eventually grow on me, though. It suits that grimy, industrial look that a lot of the stages have. I think the mix between anime and photorealism is also nicely done. It evokes a gritty Hong Kong movie feel. Yasuhiro Naito had a much smaller role in this game's development and art direction. The new designs are nevertheless a good fit for the series, particularly Quartz and the new Raven Clan antagonists. It's definitely a different take on the aesthetics of Grave's world. A distinctly South Korean one, you could say. There's God in neon lights on every street corner, no matter where you go, giving the sense that the world has been completely consumed by crime, debauchery and corruption. The setting is various places across Southeast Asia, but it's mainly centred around a dystopian cyberpunk city called Scumland. Its ghettos have been ravaged by the effects of the drug Seed. Grave and Mika are on a seemingly never-ending mission to put a stop to its spread as the El Al Canal, a resistance group waging war against the cartels wherever they can be found. This is all introduced in the game's opening cutscene, which annoyingly you can't actually watch again after starting the game. A bizarre quirk that's never been addressed in subsequent updates. Anyway, it's here we're introduced to Quartz, a new member of the cast who gives Grave directions of the radio. Grave, watch out! Mafia gangs! 
but she falls into the background for much of the early parts of the game, unless you're reading these logs on the loading screen. The story definitely feels very cheap in places. It's delivered through these cutscenes that vary wildly in quality. Some of them are very stilted and not all that interesting, while others are actually some of the coolest in the entire series, and obviously had a lot more time put into. Pretty much anything involving Bungie is easily the highlight. It was a boss fight in the previous games, but he has much more time to shine here, probably inspired by his more nuanced betrayal in the anime. In what feels like a running joke at this point, he gets resurrected for the second time. Is it because he's fated to be Brandon's eternal rival, haunting him even after death? Or do the developers just think he's cool? Probably a bit of both, maybe. Almost as soon as he turns up, the real stakes are revealed as Grave has to save Mika in time before the seed in her body kills her. A plot point from Overdose that I'm really glad they continued. But enough about the story, it's very clearly not the focus of this game or the main reason you should be playing. The gameplay of Gore is the most refined in the series yet. It takes what works about those older games and leaves behind almost everything that didn't. Unlike previous games, standing in one spot is a quick way to get you shredded by bullets, incendiaries, poisonous gas, melee attacks and any other number of things. The enemies are constantly throwing things at you to get you moving around and dodging. Because of this, you rarely have an opportunity to use Grave's signature burst mode, which I actually prefer since it feels more like a reward when you actually do get to use it now. It's particularly satisfying to use against a staggered boss. It isn't necessarily brainless, but it isn't too complicated for a drunk salaryman either. As usual, the name of the game is to shoot absolutely everything, even the scenery because all of it counts towards your beat counter, which is basically a combo. This was something that felt pointless in the VR titles, but it makes a triumphant return here with renewed purpose, giving the gameplay plenty of replayability as you try to run through the levels as quickly as possible while keeping the beat high. But if you're just there to get through the game, you still want those beats since getting 50 of them allows Grave to use Storm Barrage. This is a new mechanic to gore that's mainly used for crowd control. Every variation of it has its uses, so you're encouraged to not let your beat drop back to zero. Beats will also charge up your demolition shots, which is very soulfully illustrated by this giant skull in the top left of the screen. It's so extra compared to the other games, I love it. As in previous games, these can be used when you're in a tough spot to get some breathing room and regain a little health. It will also make the shield recharge. Performing execution moves on enemies will also kickstart shield regen, which is a great way to make you play defensively and offensively at the same time. This fixes one of my biggest issues with Overdose, where you had to stand around and wait for the shield to recharge. One mechanic from Overdose that hasn't really been improved though is the charge shot. It's clunky to use and not all that useful not to mention unusable when auto-fire is turned on. It feels like the game wants you to use this to take out the annoying shield enemies, but it's always better to just hit them with the death hauler or use fury time. After the game was updated, they became vulnerable to demolition shots too, so this mechanic is now just completely superfluous. Now, the updates are something I have to talk about in more detail, because Gore has undergone drastic changes since its initial release, I would go as far as to say that the people who played this day one essentially got a completely different game from what people are playing now. You could say that there are two different versions of Gungrave Gore. The day one version is absolutely brutal in places and has overwhelming enemy mobs. It's not really a game you play to zone out to like the others. It wants you dead. The updated version, on the other hand, is much closer to the old games in terms of difficulty and has much better flow to the combat, mainly thanks to some of the weird gameplay decisions being addressed. Now, I do want to make it clear that I liked both versions, and my praise in this video is directed at the game as a whole. I was not one of those detractors that thought Gore was awful day one. I can't deny that most of these changes were for the best. To get into some examples, you had the ability to deflect rockets with Grave's melee attack, but only when he was standing still. 
This was changed so that directional attacks could do the same, which is much closer to how it worked in Overdose, just without the annoyingly prevalent stagger. This was also a bit of a problem in Gore, but it too was fixed, making any section where you have to not fall off an edge feel much more fair. They didn't stop at just rebalancing things, though. In response to negative criticism, sections of levels have been drastically altered or outright removed. Some of these feel like a bit of an overcorrection to me. Let's look at every instance of this, or at least all of the ones that I was able to notice anyway. The time limit in Stage 6 has been removed, so now Grave can just stand around not doing anything while Mika is in trouble. The pitfalls in Stage 11 are gone. Some, but not all, of the QTEs are gone. A couple areas that required you to do some platforming no longer do. The one from Stage 17 was absolutely terrible. Everything they could have done to make this frustrating, they did. The platforms move out of sync, there was stuff above you that would mess with your jump, and you were being assailed by enemies from below. It's like someone at Iggy Mob really liked that one annoying room from Overdose. The other platforming area is at the start of Stage 30, but it isn't nearly as bad aside from one tricky jump. The lasers from the corridor outside of the Taranti boss have been turned off. Originally, this was an extremely difficult area because of the lasers' patterns and the fact that they one-shotted you. On most difficulties, it was a minor annoyance at most. But on Gore difficulty, the lack of checkpoints made it the most terrifying thing in the game. As a fan of cool laser corridors, I do wish they made it easier instead of outright removing it. It's like if they updated Resident Evil 4 and got rid of its laser corridor. Oh wait, and that freight train everyone got filtered by has been made much easier too. Originally, it was a difficult combination of a strict time limit and mines that stopped your advance. Updates remove the mines as well as the obstacles that you have to jump over. I didn't mind this part personally, if you couldn't tell. A lot of the complaints simply boiled down to skill issue. It was never that bad as long as you utilise a new Fury Time mechanic, which granted, the game does a pretty poor job of introducing you to. It buffs Grave's attack and prevents him from becoming staggered entirely, making those mines a non-issue. The only downside is that Grave can't build up his demolition gauge while it's active. One part I won't be making any excuses for, though, is this area from the end of the game. It has you fighting a battle of attrition against a large group of the toughest dickheads in the game. Even with a fully upgraded grave, which you won't have on a first playthrough, it feels nigh impossible. I couldn't beat this part and was forced to grind in the previous levels to upgrade grave's bullet damage, which is a thing in this game for some reason. I can understand unlocking new demolition shots as you go and even upgrading your maximum health, but bullet damage? In a game where the object is to keep your combo going as long as possible, this seems counterintuitive. Anyway, this area brought my playthrough to a halt, so I eventually had to switch it to easy mode to progress, which almost ruined the game for me, I'm not gonna lie. It made the final boss a breeze and left a bit of taste in my mouth, even though the ending is actually really good. Seriously, what were Iggy Mob thinking with this? Unless you go in with full demolition shots and seed fall, there's no way to win. Post update though, I've been able to pass this even on go difficulty without any issue, which is a definite improvement. I think these changes do improve the game's pacing and make it more enjoyable, but at the same time, I really don't like the idea of games being updated to make them easier. Shin Megami Tensei 5 got the same treatment. I don't like the idea of being subjected to updates just because someone else is bad at the game. It's more the principle of the thing, though, because I'm definitely not in any hurry to go back to that day one version, especially since a later update made it so that you could play as Bungie for the entire game, instead of only at specific points in the campaign. His moveset isn't nearly as big as Graves, and he doesn't have access to Storm Barrage, but he might be my favourite character to play as simply for how cool he is. He's got dual 1911s, an awesome coat, and he chain smokes. Basically the coolest character in the series. And I'll go as far as to say he usurps Juji from Overdose at this point. Also playable is Quartz, but only for a single mission. 
She has projectiles that can freeze enemies, but can only do damage with her melee attacks. This feels like a fun diversion to break things up in the middle of the game, rather than a fully fleshed out character to play as. Which is probably why she's never been made playable in the rest of the story like Bungie. She only works with these very specific enemies that don't have guns. Lastly, if you beat the game on Gore difficulty, you can unlock Brandon Heat. That's right, you can actually play as the Alive version of Grave. The version from the anime, by the looks of it. Can we take a moment to appreciate that a game from 2022 has an unlockable character for beating the highest difficulty? It's pretty much unheard of at this point. <laughs> Gungrave gore is not for everyone. That much is clear. Regardless, I think the fact that a game like this can still be made in this day and age is worth celebrating, at least a little bit. After all, what else are all those drunk salarymen going to play after a hard day's work? Pikmin 4? Fucking get real. I can only hope that this sells well enough so that Gungrave can continue into the future with more sequels. It's funny to think that, out of all of the much better received games from that era, it's Gungrave that's still going. Perhaps it's just the case that the series is just as unkillable as Beyond the Grave himself. And I wouldn't want it any other way. Anyway, I've been Snickety Slice, I'll see you around.